Okay, good morning everyone. Um, we have finished yesterday talking a little bit about um, functional uh, functional aspects of Golang. And we talked about uh, carrying. So remember I showed you uh, two, two situations. So one situation was you have a function. Uh, let me just delete the whole thing with the counter. We don't need that anymore. So if you have a function f, and the function f takes two parameters, so it takes two ints and returns an int, uh, and it you know is is a proper function which does something, then the process of turning it into a function. So if I use some mechanisms to turn it into a, a, a function f1, which takes one parameter, and that function returns another function, which also takes one parameter, um, I am doing a carrying of that function. So I turn a function, a single function of two parameters into two functions of one parameter such that the first function with one parameter with parameter A returns another function which takes the second parameter B and then it does the same thing as the original F, right? So turning a function with multiple parameters into a functions of single parameters of multiple functions of single parameters or even if I have a function of three para parameters and I turn it into one which takes two parameters so one that takes A and B and returns a function uh, I'm using kind of the, the made up notation of what it returns. It returns a function of uh, one parameter, again, of for consistency, let's call it C. Um, that would be also carrying. So I'm carrying this function into two functions, which first takes two per first parameters and then the third. I can carry it all the way. So I can carry this one as well. And then I will have three functions. So the reverse process is called uncarry. So this process is called carry. Um, so this is carry. And then the reverse is called uncarry. Uncarry. So th th this is um, this is quite important because you know it will be in the exam. <laughs> there will be a question in the exam which will ask you to carry a function in a language and then uh, potentially uncarry it. And the rationale for carrying and uncarrying will become obvious later in the course where we will need those. Um, I will also talk next week of how we use some of this, these techniques for web applications. There is additional concept which we discussed yesterday. So those are the two kind of uh, important concepts for, uh, from the language point of view from yesterday. So carrying and uncarrying. Uh, the the other one uh, was called closure. So closure, closure. The concept of the closure is that um, you have a function f, which takes or doesn't take any parameters, doesn't matter. And then you have some context, you have some vars, you have some variables here um, that um, you declare. And that provides a context in which another function works. Um, so if I return a func here, which doesn't take any parameters, doesn't return anything and does something, the, in, in the context of this function here, of this inner function, uh, I have those variables which I can use and that creates a closure for me. Uh, so a closure is um, a context of where this function lives and what this function has access to uh, and it kind of lives within those two curly braces. But if I call, you know, somewhere in my program in my main, if I call something like um, f and I get back a, uh, which is the, the function which this code block returns, then I can say that a is a closure of that context which I have here. And we've used it for this uh, global counter, for example, but we can use it for storing a database or doing something as well. So for example, in web applications, what we often do, we often pass 
um, some elements here. For example, the um, uh, request and response handlers plus the DB handler. And we leave the DB handler kind of, yeah, you will have it from this context because if, if you have a parameter here, it is accessible here as well. But here we, we uh, oh, you, you can even do it like this. You can convert the function which takes a DB or some sort of instance of your application object. And then you have a, a res, uh, request response parameters here which you know don't accept any db but inside this context here inside this function you can do stuff with with your database so you can handle requests for example http request and put them into a db because you have access to to the db but this you register with the handler uh, and that that is called closure so closures are very useful for um, converting some interfaces or some API that you are required to comply, for example, with a web server. Uh, but of course, when you're handling your requests, you do need access to your database or you need access to something. Uh, and that you can use closure concept for that. So closure is this, this context. You can um, read more about those two concepts um, later. And we will cover that in Haskell as well. So we will talk more about carrying and uncarrying in Haskell. Uh, because it is quite fundamental to Haskell. Um, and we can talk about the, the closures all the time because in, in, in Rust, in um, Golang and in Haskell, it's very useful feature to, to operate on, on closures because they give you this encapsulation, this form of hiding things from outside the world such that you can do computations that you need with the data that only is visible here. In object-oriented languages, we use a uh, concept of objects and classes to, to do this type of hiding. But uh, closures are older, and closures are more a uh, clean way of hiding stuff from outside world, because the unit of where the stuff is hidden is, is in the function itself. In classes, the class has a state, but you have multiple methods, and the methods kind of share that state, whether they need it or not. Right, so in object-oriented programming, if you have some methods that don't use that state, they still have access to that state. And the question is why? Why should a method or a function have access to something that it should not have access to? Uh, in functional programming, you can really limit the scope to the bare minimum, and closures are a, a, a neat mechanisms to achieve that. Um, can you also write? Yeah, so I will. Um, I will not do the uncarry in Golang. It's a bit of a nightmare. I, you will not need to do that. So the, you can do uncarry in C++ and in, in, in even the modern C++ and in, in Golang, but it's not pretty. It's a, a lot of typing. It's a lot of stuff that you have to do. So as, as long as carrying is nice in Golang, uncarrying is not as nice uh, and it's even worse in C++. Uh, and carry and uncarry are super easy in Haskell because Haskell is built for those types of things. And then we will explore it more. So I, I will not um, write here how, how you will do uncarry because it's a little bit of typing. Um, can you give us some exercises after this lecture where we can practice writing carrying and uncarrying functions? Yeah, I, I can do that. So I can give some additional tasks for uh, trying that out. Sure. I think I will try to think of something that is uh, not not uh, just theoretical, but something that we use in practice, like a pattern that we often use. There will be next week. There will be patterns with uh, with carrying and con um, closures for web applications, like I just described here, and we will talk more about that in the context of writing handlers for our URL requests. So then you will notice uh, more. All right, so let's start the, the lecture again. I di digressed quite a lot. We are 10 minutes late, <laughs> but not too bad. Let's do a, a short quiz. So the, uh, the, the question to you is, I know what pipes are and I, what a standard IO is. 
and I've used it. I know it very well. I know it a little bit and I don't have idea what you're talking about. So just tell me uh, what, what do you think about standard IOs and pipes? That looks pretty good. Uh, so most people know what it is and they used it. There are some people who didn't. So I will very quickly digress again into a terminal and talk a little bit about um, a little bit about uh, pipes and standard IO. So thank you for the for the input on this. So what are standard IO and pipes? So they are related to the concept of a terminal and terminal, the, the way we see it these modern days is related to a concept of a terminal when we had mainframes and when we had to you know, telecommunicate to the computer. So in the old days, the computer was somewhere in the basement for the entire school. And then everybody had like a physical device which was called the terminal and it had the screen and the keyboard. And while you were typing, it was sending the keys, keystrokes to the big computer and then showing you what the big computer outputs were. And this communication was using sort of standard IO. So you are feeding some characters into the machine and the machine sends you some characters back. And it was based on text. We didn't have back in the old days any graphical interfaces. It was just... Um, um, I think 80 characters by 40 sort of screens. So the, the concept of a terminal comes back from those old days and effectively we have a shell. So a shell provides us ability to uh, put some commands and execute them. Um, and then if I uh, in, input a command um, that print something to the standard output, I will sort of see it on my terminal uh, in, the, in the terminal window. And I can also ask uh, something from the terminal. So we can uh, very quickly write a, a very quick um, hello bash shell. So if I say hello shell, and if I say quickly that it's a uh, it's a bash shell and it reads a line. In, in our case, let's, let's call it the name. And it uh, outputs welcome with the name. Then if I save it and I run it, so if I run, uh, I have to change it to be executable. Right, so if I run my hello shell, it will now block and it will wait for my input. So I can enter some text and it will wait until I press enter. So while I'm typing, so if I if I say Marius, while I'm typing my characters, it continues reading it, but it doesn't uh, um, match it with the, with the variable that I set. It will match it the moment I, I press enter. So the moment I press enter, it does the second line. So if I... Um, if I do cut, hello, hello, bash. Yeah. So cut is a command which takes the the text file and prints line by line everything that is in the te te text file into the standard output. So because the standard output is my terminal, it prints it to the terminal again. So as you see, it, this command pr prints it to the terminal, and this command waits for the line, for the first line, and then prints something to the terminal. So this communication through the terminal is called like pipes. Uh, and the, the name comes from the ability to chain those, those outputs out. So for example, I can, um, I can echo something to the terminal, uh, echo Marius and it prints Marius to the terminal, but I can also echo it to something else. So I can echo it 
to my hello. So if I write hello shell, you see now hello shell doesn't wait for my input because it already got it from the terminal because I pushed Marius through the pipe to this program and it printed hello Marius. Uh, if I push something else, if I push uh, Dafina, then it will say uh, welcome Dafina, right? So this ability to chain what flows to whom, and then um, this, this program always reads from standard input. Uh, the pipe, the symbol, the, the, um, the uh, horizontal um, ver vertical line uh, on the keyboard means kind of a chaining things. And then I can chain from one program to another. And then I can even chain from this one um, instead of printing it into the, into the terminal, what I can do is uh, I can chain it and save it to a file. So for saving to a file, we use this symbol, which is kind of a redirection of the pipe. Uh, and I can call it file.txt. And then this sequence doesn't print anything on the screen. It just feeds this string into this program and then output of this program into that file. And now if I do cut file txt, I will see that the, the string that was saved eventually uh, into that file. Does it make sense? So I have some sort of pipe. You can think it of a pipe. And then programs can write to it. And then if nobody reads it, like for example, I have a pipe like this. So th this program pu pushes something to the standard pipe. Uh, and the, the standard pipe is attached to my terminal. So such that I will see what on the other end, what that program generated. And that program generated the name Dafina, and then I see it on my, on my terminal. But I can attach something else to the other end of that pipe by doing this, this thing, and then feed it to somebody else. Uh, and then this somebody else will do something with this input, and again, push something to the output. So if nothing is attached to that output, it will go to the terminal. I can attach something else to that output and do another thing, right? So what if I, I call hello twice, right? So this hello takes input from here, and this hello takes input from both, from, from the final run of this. So what would you expect? Uh, what, would, what would you expect out of this? You can use the chat window to, to tell me. Yeah, you would expect welcome, welcome Dafina, right? So the the first one feeds Dafina to welcome name, which is welcome Dafina, and then this one prints welcome Dafina, which this this one adds another welcome in front. Uh, so this is all great, and we will use it in our programs to commit for programs to communicate. So one program will read something from the input such that the human can. Uh, put something in. Um, no, it, it, it's actually quite hard to, to do it this way that you chain programs and the first one is with the human because for human to interact with the program, the human needs to be on the other end of the pipe. So you, you see, so that would not work. But what we will do is we will make one program communicating with another in, through the pipe in such a way that you can um, send responses back and forth between two programs. So just to um, demonstrate, because here we have the chain which flows one way. So the output of this goes into input of this, and the output of this goes into input of this, and the output of this goes to the terminal. Um, but what if I want the output of this goes to the input of, of the first one, right? What if I want to chain both hellos such that uh, I have a loop. Uh, I cannot kind of do it in a linear fashion like this. And for that, we have a concept of um, named pipes. Let me see the slides if I uh, have it here. So there is a standard input on one end of the pipe, standard output. And also often in your programs, what you can do is you can redirect standard error. 
Uh, typically, standard output and standard error are in the same type. Uh, they are attached to the same thing. But your program, from, from within your program, you can decouple it such that you can direct errors to a different pipe and, for example, save them into a file and direct output to the terminal such that the human can interact with it. So you can de decouple those two if you want to. Um, but by default, those two go to the same place. And by default, they both go to the, to the terminal. Um, so that's the uh, standard, input, uh, standard output. And then you have pipes. And then you have named pipes. So all we experienced here were unnamed pipes, because I didn't name, you know, I, I just chain things together, but I didn't name them. Um, but on many operating systems, you have something called named pipes. And I can make, um, I think it's, yeah. So in my, uh, on, in my environment, it's called make FIFO, which stands for first in, first out. And it basically creates a pipe, which is named. Uh, and it creates like a special file, which people can write to and read from, but that file has zero size and it's only used for passing data through. So I can, um, I can call my, my pipe uh, whatever name I want. So let's call it uh, pipe one. And then I just created a, a pipe. And if I look into my folder, into my directory, you will see that there is something which is called pipe one and it has this bar at the end. And it has zero size and I own it. And it has kind of a sp special flags that makes it a pipe such that I can efficiently chain large amounts of data through it between programs back and forth. So now what I can do is I can say, I want to echo, uh, yeah, let, let's say uh, I'm echoing Dafina, but instead of doing a pipe symbol, I'm using the file symbol and I'm saying it goes to pipe one. Okay, so now what, what this command does, it's taking standard input from the terminal because on the entry to this program, there is nothing. Uh, it puts something into output of the standard output and the standard output is redirected to the pipe. So if I do that, nothing happens, right? It hangs. It hangs because nobody is reading from that pipe. I, I don't have the other end of the, of the pipe attached yet. So now what I can do, I can start a new terminal. So if I make it bigger and I go to fish and I go to projects uni prog and I double check that my pipe is here. No, it's in examples. So yes, I, I am in the, the same folder now. So I am in the same folder as I am uh, with this terminal. And if I do, so now what we can do is we can read from that file. So one command for reading is our hello. So what we can do is we can say, okay, um, hello should read from pipe one, right? So we are now changing the standard input of this file to be the pipe, which is the named pipe instead of the standard input from the terminal. And if I do that, then what you see is that hello got input from the pipe, read the, 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 what the pipe had to offer and printed the hello. And then this one could finish because it wrote what it should write to the, to the pipe. And then it doesn't have anything else to write. Everything which was written was read, so it quit, right? So this is kind of how you can connect uh, one program writing to a pipe and another program reading from a pipe and you can make it arbitrary uh, complex. The, the only restriction is that you can only, like only one source can write to a pipe and one source can read from a pipe at, at, a, at a time. It's sort of a single, um, single access thing. So if I try to write to a pipe and if I try to write, um, to a pipe, then this one writes first. So it's not like they are competing. The, this one reads 
uh, writes first. This one will write after this one is done. And then if I have another, so I will open it here and then decouple it. Then I don't have to change the directory that much. So now if I read from that pipe, so I can uh, remember my, our hello was reading only one thing at a time, only one line. So if I do hello to read from a pipe, only one of them uh, will uh, finish and it's the Daphina. And then um, this one got kind of screwed. <laughs> so th this one read the one thing and, and, and quit. So let's experiment. So let, let me write again twice to the pipe. And in, instead of using the hello, which only reads one line and then stops reading, I will uh, use another um, another program, which you can use for reading stuff and cut reads everything which is there. So then if I do that, you see this one cleanly read both lines. So it read the, the first line from, from this, then it read the second line from this, printed both lines and both quit, you know, um, cleanly. And the reason why the first hello didn't work for this one is because as I said, hello started reading from a pipe, but then after the first line, it, it quit and it broke the pipe. Like you cannot have multiple people reading from a pipe uh, because the pipe has only one output. And then whatever is being written there has to be read. Once you open it for reading, you have to read the whole thing. Um, I hope it makes, makes sense. All right, so this is, I can close those things. This is a little bit of a theory of how the piping and terminal works and how you can use it with the, with the commands. So, you know, echo is a useful command. Like if, if you have a program, which for example, needs you say yes for something, uh, and then this yes question comes after 20 minutes. So you, you start something and you know, after some time, this program will ask you for confirmation. What you can do is you can sort of do this or this, depending what the program expects, and then redirect it to a pipe, and then start your, your program with, um, so like a program, and then it will run. And uh, yeah, of course you have to redirect the, the pipe uh, to, to your program. And then at that point of the question, the yes will happen and the program will continue. So you will not need to physically do that. Uh, there is, um, there is a special device uh, called, um, yeah, I don't remember if I have it or not. I seem not to have it, but on Linux you have a device which is ba basically yes. Uh, and you can pipe from this device to any application that you want and it will always say yes to, to questions. Um, all right, so let me quit that. Right, any questions about pipes and named pipes? Once, once you're done with a pipe, so you know, you remember we have this pipe here. Uh, I can delete it so I can just remove pipe. And that's it. Uh, they don't use resources. If you need to pass data, like large, amount of data, gigabytes of data from somewhere to somewhere else and do some processing, pipes are really efficient way of doing it. So kernel will do buffering and will do this passing for you. And it's extremely efficient way of, um, of processing, processing data. All right, so that's standard input, standard output. And let's do reading, so let's, use Golang to read something from standard input such that we can do something inside a program with it and put something to standard output. You already know how to do standard output because we've been using format fmt.printline or print or printf. They all by default write to standard output. Um, when reading from standard input, you have to make some considerations. So first you have to ask yourself how big is the input? So if the input is one line, that's different, you know, method. If the input is one gigabyte, yeah, that's a difference also. If the input is, you know, 300 gigabytes, then you may exceed your RAM. 
So you cannot read the whole thing into RAM and do processing in RAM. You have to do something more clever, right? So the question is, how should I read it? Uh, should I read it line by line? Should I read it, read it word by word? Uh, should I allocate a certain buffer? Sometimes you're reading files and you say, I, I, I will create a four kilobytes or I don't know, 64 kilobytes buffer in, in memory and will read buffer by buffer and then do something with it. Um, you, you cannot uh, usually read the whole thing at once because you're running a risk of running out of RAM. So it depends exactly what you're doing it for. That's which, which strategy you will choose. Um, and it's uh, in all languages, it's the same. And then the question is how you're processing the data. So can, do you need to process data like the entire data at once? So for example, we have this concept of um, HTML. So, you know, you know HTML. HTML is a hypertext markup language used in the websites. And it's, um, it, it, it is kind of in a form of um, kind of XML tags. So you have starts, start node and end node. Um, and then you have three of those nodes inside the document. Uh, and there are two ways of processing it. One is called DOM. So um, DOM stands for um, data object model, I guess. I don't remember exactly the acronym, but it, it is basically uh, a tree of objects which are nested within each other. So to, to process the DOM, you have to read the entire document and then generate the entire tree of how the root node is connected to the leaf nodes and how they are forming the tree, right? So it's uh, entire tree, entire tree at once. Okay, and that's what we used in Java. Initially, that's what we used uh, everywhere. Uh, we use this concept of a DOM, um, but for very large documents, and you know, we use uh, XML and HTML for because I, I use that HTML as an example, but it's effectively for XML as well. We use XML for uh, special documents, uh, and often those documents are huge. They they can be a couple of uh, gigabytes in size. And then doing DOM processing, if the document is larger than your RAM, is impossible, right? So um, an alternative way of processing it is called um, SAX. And again, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, uh, but the idea is that it's a sequential access to the, those nodes. So instead of generating the giant tree of all the nodes and then doing some processing with this tree, what you do is you, you read uh, line by line and you read the tag by tag and you issue events. You say, I'm starting a particular, like, so, so in DOM, let, let me explain. If, if I have this a, a HTML um, tree, so I have HTML as a top, root, top node and then I have a body, um, like this, and then let's say I have another child which is called head, and I have um, like this, right? So I have a very simple tree. Um, so this is a little bit stubborn, doesn't want to align, but now it will align. So I have a, a single tree, and I have a one top top level root node called HTML, and then I have two children, head node and then body node. Uh, and DOM, I would have to read the whole thing, create the top, top root node called HTML, and it will have two children. And I have to do the whole thing at once. In SACS, what will happen is I will go line by line and I will do this. I will say, um, I have a root node which starts here and it's called HTML. I have a child node of the previous node, which I told you about, and it's called head. It starts here. This head node, which I told you before about, finishes here. And then there is a new child node of the previous node, which I told you about, which was this one, which is body. And then the body finishes here. And then the top level node finishes here. So it issues events at the time when it's going the linear parsing through the document, such that you can take certain actions. And then you can process the head 
And once you've finished processing the head, you can completely ignore it. You can remove it from, from memory and focus on the other nodes such that you only kind of have a sliding window through your processing. Uh, and this is much more efficient way and it only needs to store some of the context uh, for your processing, but it doesn't need to store the entire tree. So for example, if I'm only interested in a particular input uh, field, particular input node, I can ignore all the nodes which don't fulfill my criteria. Once I hit, I'm starting this node that you're interested in, then I do my processing and then I finish, right? Uh, with DOM, I couldn't do that. I have to read the whole thing, build the giant tree, then find the node I'm interested in, and then do some processing. So uh, DOM was, I mean, DOM is still used sometimes, uh, for example, in browsers, because the browsers have to have the entire DOM to render it on the, on the page, web page. But for documents and for XML processing, we almost don't use DOM processing anymore. So this kind of boils down to how you want to process data. Are you processing data line by line? Are you processing word by word as a stream? Do you want to be lazy in terms of, of processing? Um, so you, you have to answer uh, yourself those questions, right? All right, so I don't remember what I meant by the last point here. <laughs> it's empty. Uh, any questions? If you don't have questions, then let's move on and let's do some I.O. with Go. And I will pretend that I don't know anything about I.O. in Go, such that I will actually have to search for it. Um, so we have two options. We have option of uh, Googling Stack Overflow or, or using Google uh, to say, OK, read stuff from input, standard input. Uh, which is one way of doing it. I tend not to do that. As I told you, I tend to go for um, documentation directly. So what I will do is I will go golang, golang.org and I will go to documents and I will go to packages, package documentation. And I will try to find, you know, let's try to find IO in this page and well, you know, we have buffer IO, which sounds promising. Uh, where else do we have IO? We have format. Well, we know about format already. That's great. Uh, and we have some IO utilities uh, and we have networking. So networking is not what we want to do. We don't want to do any networking, any remote procedure calls. So those are not useful. So the useful things is IO util. Um, format, which we know a little bit about, and buffer IO, right? So we have three packages in Go, which sound reasonable for us to check. So let me open this. Let me open uh, format, format, and let me open IO util. All right, so let's start with IO util. And IO util doesn't have um, a lot of functions to read about. So it has a function called read all, which sounds really promising if we want to remember the, the questions that I've asked, uh, how you're gonna read, uh, how should we read it? So if, if you want to read the whole thing, it seems read all sounds, you know, like the stuff that we want, let's check it out. So read all, reads, uh, read all reads from R until an error or end of file and returns the da data as it is read. So it will return me the whole thing. Uh, and there isn't even an example. So it uses uh, a strings new reader to pass to the, uh, to the IO util read all. And it will effectively read the, the whole thing and print it as a string. Uh, Sounds really good. We could use it. So if our idea is to read the whole thing, uh, we will we will have the answer. Before I use it, let's try, let's see the format. So format has all those formatting strings. Um, oh yeah, that's the answer for my problem. I use lower T instead of capital T in the lecture. So here you go. You have for, for printing type, you use capital T. Um, that's useful reference. 
Okay, so that's about formatting, scanning. Yes, scanning is something that we probably want. So uh, let's see about scan. Scan text reads from standard input, storing successive space separated values into successive arguments. Whoa, that's something useful too. So for example, if we want to do hello Marius, we could use scan to read from standard input the token, which is uh, space separated. And then we just need the first one. So that would be our uh, function for reading tokens, like reading words. Okay, so we learned something about IO utils already. We learned something about scanning. Uh, and then in buffer IO, uh, let's jump directly to examples because there is a lot of functions to read about. Uh, and let's see what, yeah, I missed the examples. Where are the examples? So we have examples. Uh, we have scanners for reading bytes. We have scanner for reading lines. Woohoo! So if we want to read line by line, maybe that's what we want. And then there is another scanner which reads word by word. Uh, so let's check it out. So the scanner which reads um, line by line is using buffer IO and it calls itself new scanner. It uses standard input, OS standard input, sounds promising. And then it is calling successively scan uh, to read uh, text from the, from the standard input. That sounds great. And here we even have the words. Uh, the words is using, so um, it's using a, a method called scanner split. So this scan, I will not show you the definition I just tell you. So the scan reads stuff up to certain threshold. And by default, the scanner reads line by line. If you want a different behavior, like as you see here, this one is line by line and you don't have any special here. But if you want to read word by word, you have to instruct it that the splitting happens by words, okay? So uh, let me go back to the task. So what was the task? The task was um, reading standard input and counting words. So we supposed to read the whole thing uh, somehow and then count, count the words, but now we have two options. We can either use read all from uh, buffer IO. So we can read the whole thing as a string and then count the words, or we can use the reading by words and count them as we read them. And effectively this, this one is already the, the program which does it, right? So if I copy and paste it, so I take it, I uh, change, I did it the whole thing here. Okay, uh, and I paste it and I don't want to be reading from input here. What I want is I want to read from standard input, right? So remember, we want to do this um, type of thing. We want to scan from standard input. So instead of um, so it's called, it's called new scanner and the scanner takes the reader and os.standardinput is already a, a, a standard input. So I, I just need to modify this. <clears throat> so I will say, oops, os standard input. Great, so that looks, that looks our, like our solution, right? So I am creating an instance of a scanner. Uh, I'm telling the scanner to split, split the reading word by word. And then I have a counter. And then as I read, I increment the counter. And then uh, if I have some error, I print an error. Otherwise I print the count of the words. Looks pretty good to me. So I will save it. I will, I could configure IntelliJ to, to run it, but I will basically compile it. Um, go build, I will compile it here. 
And then I have my, what is it called? Why it's, yeah, it's called examples. So remove hello shell. I will leave the, the hello shell. It may come later handy. So um, if I call the examples, um, examples are waiting for my input. So I say, Marius is speaking to the class new line. And there is a second line, new line. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve words, and I will close the stream. So while while you are providing input to my pipe, which examples are reading from, which is the standard input pipe, if I press Control D, that closes my terminal pipe for that particular pipe. So Control D closes it, and here we have the answer from the program, twelve words. So it works. Uh, magically with no hiccups. And we pretty much solved it by not touching Stack Overflow. And we know that we have a very idiomatic way of solving that problem because we got it from the horse mouth of Go, you know, Golang doc, right? Um, so sometimes, yes, you can go to Stack Overflow, but sometimes it's simpler and faster if you just check the docs. Um, so this one, is one way of reading and splitting the words. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't store the words. It's only. It only counts them, right? So it counts the words, but it doesn't store them anywhere. Uh, so let's modify it. Uh, and I will. Again, I, I, we could spend time reading the doc, but I've done it already. So I will just tell you. Um, but in the future, I encourage you to to read the docs. Uh, so instead of counting it here, I will not count it and I will not count it. So what I will do instead, I will create myself a slice. So I will call it, um, I will call, call the slice lines and I will say it's a slice of strings. Uh, actually it's not lines because we're reading word by word. So I will call them words, right? So now I have, um, an empty, and I need to initialize it, right? So um, I have uh, not count, but store. I'm storing the words because I'm reading them and I will do some processing later with them, right? So now here I am, I need to store them. So I need to append each red word to my, to my slice. So what I will do is I will say words equals append words, and then I have to get the next word. And to get the next word, there is a very useful function called text, <clears throat> which just returns you the next token. So if you check the docs, you will realize that text returns you the next token that scanner scanned from the, from the input or from the, the, the pipe that it's using. I don't have to use standard input. I can use a file or I could use a pipe like a named pipe. But by specifying it here that I'm reading it from standard input, then I know it's from standard input. So now this loop um, goes until the end of the file and appends all, all the words for me, right? So what I will do is I will just, for the sake of debugging it, I will print line it. So let's see how they look like. Uh, and then I will for a moment not, yeah, we, yeah, we don't have count anymore, but how can we get the count of words? So if I add here, uh, we have the number of words just so we know what it is. How can I get it? How do I know how many words do I have? quite simple. I just need to check the length. Yeah, exactly. The length of my words. It's the number of words I, I have, right? So that sounds great. So let's save it and let's build it and let's run it again. So Marius is talking. Three words and a file. And we see I have a slice with three words. And the program says that I got three words. So I've modified the program now in such a way that it reads the words and returns them to me. 
So to make it even more useful, uh, what I can do is I can now change the whole thing and say, I have a function which is called read words and it takes nothing. Um, okay, so let's call it read words from standard input. It takes nothing as an input uh, and returns me a slice of strings of string. Uh, and then I just copy the whole thing over there. So do that. And return words. And here I have now, for example, words equals read words from standard input. So it looks a little bit more tidy. And in fact, because it's a very useful utility function, I could probably make it into a module or package and have it exported with capital R and keep the main only like, like this and make this one reusable across other projects, right? Um, to make it even nicer, what I probably should do is I should say, uh, if something went wrong, I returned an error uh, such that I propagate the error upwards. So in here, if something went wrong, I would say there was an error and then I deal with the error here. Um, if, you, if you're writing your functions and if you're writing your code, you always ask yourself, what type of error did I encounter? Is it an error that I have to deal right here, right now? Uh, and then um, it's fine. Or is it an error that I have to tell my caller, look, the, while I was doing my stuff, there was an error, like deal with it. Or is the error that is like so screw up that there is no recovery that like I just need to kill the program, right? So usually we have three levels of errors which we encounter while we write code. And then you ask yourself, what type of error do I am dealing right now here about? Um, so in this particular case, while I'm reading it, I might have, um, it, it's a little bit tricky, right? Because <laughs> I can start reading from a non-existing file or whatever, but here we dealing with standard input. Uh, what can go wrong? Um, I don't know what can go wrong, but some things could go wrong. Uh, so maybe it's something I don't need to tell my caller about, but I can kind of ignore and give it whatever partial results do I have. Uh, of some sort, maybe the pipe got broken, like maybe somebody killed the pipe or something, but I've already read some words. So maybe it's not something I have to escalate. Maybe I, I can kind of deal with it. So if you make a conscious decision that you're dealing with the error here and you're printing to standard error that there was a problem, then maybe we can ignore the error and don't tell the caller about it. So I would say in this particular case for the assignments, that is a reasonable thing to do. So you can, if you're reading from standard input, if you're reading from a file, no, you have to propagate it because maybe the file name was given from a user and the user mistype it. And then this guy, this function says, oh, the file doesn't exist. And the caller says, oh yeah, I will ask the user to check the name of the file because maybe the user made a mistake, right? So if this function was uh, reading from a file, then you cannot deal with the error internally. You have to escalate it. But because we're reading from standard input, there is no reliance on the, uh, on the user and the caller cannot really fix anything. Uh, then I think dealing with it here is fine. All right, so that's all great. Any questions about that? So now you have kind of a template of how to read from standard input and how to um, deal with the data. I will do one more uh, because it's uh, useful for the next exercise. So the next one is I have my strings and then I need, for example, yeah, so for example, I, I am here, I have my words, but I, I don't want words because I want to print not how many words do I have, but I want to print the sum. So when I run it, I want to run it with numbers and I want to print, um, so control D, 
Um, I, I don't want to print how many of, of the numbers I have, but I just want to add them together. So how can I convert a string to an integer? Um, so again, you know, your, um, your documentation is your friend. So if I go to the packages, um, let's say conversions. So I have encodings. And what else do I have? I have strconf. Uh, package strconf implements conversions to and from string representations of basic data types. Yay, here we hit jackpot again. So strict conversion is, oh, and look, even in the first example, we already know how to convert string to a number uh, because it just tells you. It's called ASCII to integer. And you do it like this. So uh, great. So let's just copy and paste that. Um, so I want uh, numbers, numbers. I want a slice of numbers, and it's a slice of ints. And currently it's empty. And then what I will do is I will do a for loop. So for I don't care about the index of the word that I'm dealing with. I just need the word and it's a range of words. And then what we do for each of the word, uh, we do this, right? Instead of minus 42, we use the word and then we have the number and we have an error, <clears throat> right? So I have the number and I have the error. Um, if there was an error, again, a question, should I escalate it? Uh, you know, obviously I'm, I cannot escalate beyond main. I'm already in main, so I have to deal with the error here. So if error is different, come on, is different than nil, I have to deal with it, deal with it. So yeah, I, we print something. So print line, we got error and then we can, um, Actually, we don't need to do call anything on it. Uh, yeah, and then I have to add, so numbers equals append numbers n. All right, so what I'm doing wrong here, um, Oh uh, yeah, it's the, I'm, of course I'm not assigning, I'm checking if it's different. Yeah, so if error is different than nil, it's okay. Uh, here we got our, uh, our numbers and now we have the slice of numbers. So then we need to have a sum. So let's say sum is zero uh, for, we don't care about the index for a value of my number or for uh, consistency, we can call it N and we say range numbers. So now I will say sum plus plus equals n. Um, and then we print the sum. The sum is. Alright, so let's test it. So we build it. We run it and we say one, two, three, the sum should be six. Oh yeah, control D and the sum is six, way, perfect. So now we have um, two utility functions. One utility function is read words from a standard input. And then the other utility function is func which uh, converts words into ints. So it takes um, words, which is a slice of string and returns us a slice of int. And then we just copy and paste that stuff in there. Oh yeah, so uh, here. Right, so now we have numbers and we return numbers. 
So again, the question is, should we deal with the error internally or should we tell the caller? Um, a, mm, yeah, I'm not so sure now. So let, let us try. So um, this one, this one is numbers equals what I would convert. Yeah, so we use words. So now uh, we have two utility functions. And in fact, um, you know, I'm doing the processing of standard input, getting the words, and I'm putting words in here. So in fact, I, I don't care about words. I, I don't really need that. The, it's only for readability. Uh, but I, for demonstration purposes, I will remove the words and I will do this instead, which is exactly the same. It makes the code in Golang potentially slightly less readable, maybe, um, but it makes it more functional. Uh, so in just, a, again, a, a digression, uh, in imperative programming, uh, you have instructions. Uh, you have instructions, instructions. Oh, come on. You have some instructions, 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 instructions. And those, like if I have a function here, I have a function. The function is effectively instructions such that I can think about another instructions, instructions, and then you have another function and then you have instructions and so on. And you get the picture, right? So your program is collection of calls to functions which are nested with other functions and they form this kind of a giant list of functions that you are executing, right? So all of those functions, they have some state. So they produce some, um, they produce some side effects. Side effects, effects, uh, some state like we did with the words, right? So when we had the original code, <clears throat> I had words. Uh, and the words came from some function, and then <clears throat> and then I had numbers, and numbers came from some other function, um, and then you have something else, and then you, you you see that there is kind of accumulation of state, and then I if I have a function here, so I have a function gg, um, then maybe gg uses numbers, maybe gg uses words, maybe there is some dependency of those of those things. Right, and in imperative programming, it's, it becomes, if you have those complex programs, it becomes a bit of a chaos. Like uh, things read from somewhere and get some data from somewhere and, and, and so on. So it, it, <clears throat> it's a lot of flexibility, but it's also a lot of uh, um, dependency on state which has been generated earlier, right? In comparison, functional programming uh, you end up with a function which called another function, 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 right? So you end up with this chain of nested functions, uh, which is called function composition. Uh, and that's exactly what we did here. We effectively composed two functions to compute something, which is called numbers, right? So this is a function composition of two functions. Oops. Um, which is a simple form of functional programming um, in such a way that the output of this function becomes the input of this function. And I don't have any state lying around. I don't have any context lying around. I have everything kind of nice and tidy in the single line, right? So functional programming kind of looks like this. Uh, so in a simple form, um, that, you know, in, in total, that looks like, like this, but in a sing single form, I have, for example, something like this. So I have G and the output of G becomes input of F and then output of F becomes input of H and then, and so on, right? Uh, and I, I know how the chain works. I can reason about it. If I do it this way and I have, uh, you know, I have output of G being A, so A is an output of G. I have B, which is output of F, which takes G or take, takes A in our case. Um, I have kind of an, an explicit uh, state and an explicit things which are kind of hanging around and being passed in. And then what I can have, I can have uh, C, which is uh, the output of H, which needs to take, like in this, in this case, um, 
needs to take um, B, right? Um, but th in, in this case, it's, it's kind of simple, it's linear, but in, in more complex cases, I can have uh, multiple parameters being passed. I mean, F could return two things and then H takes two things uh, and so on. So in, in Golang, it's quite nice because if, if this one takes two things and this one returns two things, you can still compose it. So it, it, you, you can do programming like this and, um, and get this sort of a functional feel. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm, I'm not arguing that functional way of composing functions, it's always better. I'm just demonstrating the difference. So in Golang, you can do functional compositions and it looks like this. Um, in Haskell, uh, the functional composition looks would look like this. Uh, and then you, because G doesn't take any parameters, then that's your functional com composition, right? So in, 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 in imperative programming, if you have composition uh, of G producing something, you would have to say like what, what, what I did here, right? So. <clears throat> so, yeah, so th this line is a functional composition of two functions. Those two lines is the imperative way of composing G and F. G doesn't take any parameters, <clears throat> produces something, and then F takes what G produced and produces something. The problem is that um, this A um, like if I have some lines of code here, I have some lines of code, I have to look what this A comes from. And this A could have, have been mutated along the way already. And I don't have a guarantee that it actually comes from G. Whereas here, the, there is what's called a referential transparency. And it means that um, G is always the same. And the output of G is always the same because G doesn't take any input uh, and then F so, so I, I have certain reasoning which I can do here. Um, in imperative programming, it, it's more flexible, but it's also a little bit more messy because I, uh, you know, I have to analyze myself where A came from. Uh, oh yeah, the A came from this line. Uh, and then did I mutated A along the way? No, I didn't, uh, great. So I know this line is equivalent of this line, but I have to do this analysis. If I look at this line, I don't need to do any analysis because it's in my face. Like I know what is happening right away, right? Um, so sometimes a function composition and the uh, functional way of structuring your problem is a little bit cleaner. Uh, in this particular case, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's so simple that the original code for some people probably might be more readable, especially if those two lines are next to each other. Uh, but this is just the um, example. I, yeah, someone is calling me. All right, so um, <clears throat> any questions about that? So if there are no questions, let's move on to the actual tasks. So we've done some uh, reading from IO. Um, and what's next? Right, so we have a problem which says, uh, given a list of ints as string separated by spaces, find pairs of indexes i and j such that um, i is smaller than j and the sum of those numbers is divisible by d. So using those two utility functions, we can read our integers and all we are asked to do is we ask to find pairs such that the first number is uh, earlier in the list than the, the second number. Uh, so they cannot be the same number and we don't use pairs. Um, I will show you in the next slide, uh, turn around, such that we check if the sum is divisible by the first number which is given in the list, right? So if I give you an example, um, so for example, let's use the second example because it's easier. So we are trying to find numbers which are divisible by five and we have a list of numbers which is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. This list is so nice that the index of the number and the number itself are the same, right? So index of this element is zero and the value is zero. Index is one, value is one. So it's easy to find the pairs. So the 
zero and five is divi divisible by five because it, you know zero plus five is five. Uh, one plus four, two plus three, and four plus six. Right. So we have zero uh, and five, one, one and four, two and three, and four and six. Uh, no other pairs um, divisible by five, um, and we don't count a pair six and four because we start with the first number. That's what this condition was, that the first index, um, the first index has to be lower than the second index, right? So we don't we do this sum without repetitions. So this is a very simple task. So try to, you know, let's assume you already have those functions. Uh, all you need to do now, you have to write a function. So, so you write, you need to write a function which uh, counts pairs divisible by D and then D is the first integer and then the nums is the slice of ints and it returns the int. So assuming that you have those other two functions to solve this problem, uh, we basically convert, um, convert the word to ints and then um, we don't calculate the sum, we calculate the number of pairs and the number of pairs is called count count pairs divisible by D. And uh, there is a small twist to the thing because we got all the numbers. So when we, when we read this, we will read this as an entire slice, right? So the first number is five, which is our D and then the data is from this number. So what do we need to con convert it here? Um, so let me make it a little bit up here. So the first element is D, which is our first number of our numbers. So we say numbers of zero is our D. And then we have to pass the actual numbers, which is the same numbers, but we have to skip the first element. So we use this uh, Golang notation for cutting the slice. And we say, I want the slice of numbers, but skip the, the zero element, give me all the elements from one onwards, right? So this is a number of pairs. And then you can say number of, of pairs here, and that would be the solution. So the number of pairs divisible by D, uh, no, we don't have D, we have numbers zero is this, right? So by D is, is this number. So that's our solution to, to this problem. What all I want, to, want you to write now is this function. So how can you count which pairs of these nums are divisible by D? Easy. So things to consider, of, of obviously you have to, yeah, how to read from standard input, how to tokenize the input, how to represent the data and where is the documentation. So uh, we have the documentation on the Golang site. Uh, we tokenize the input using the, um, the method of scanning words such that we got the, the uh, token by token. Um, and we, um, yeah, what was the next question? And we represent the data as a slice of ints eventually for that problem. Um, so think of, think of how you do that. And if you can write me Golang code, write Golang code, if you, can just write pseudocode, write pseudocode. Um, what I will do is I will not recompile it because we changed the code, but I will try the sum of the integers and I will try, okay, let's double check that it works with the integers. Yes, it still works. What if I put a float? 
So what if I put a float and an integer and an integer and close it? Um, we have, um, so let me analyze what happened. So we entered those three numbers and then those three numbers got represented as a um, slice of, I deleted the code so that I don't remember what we were doing here, but I think those are strings. So I think it's a kind of a, our words. So this is our word, this is our word, and this is word. So we got those three words and then we are converting them to integers. And then on the first one, we got an error. So we got an error which says, well, you know, 1.2 is not an integer in valid syntax and our scanner, our converter skipped it. So it only converted one and three to our slice of integers and then gave a, a correct sum. Right, so is that the behavior you want? You want the, your program to skip the invalid entries? Yeah, maybe. So let, let's try again. So if I say Marius one and five or one and four uh, and, and enter again, it, it's the same behavior, right? So it skips the wrong ones. So what if I call it uh, with one, two, Marius, uh, Papa, and that's three and two and the end. Yeah, so th this is the behavior of um, dealing with the errors inside the inner conversion and just printing the, uh, the problem of some of the tokens that are mistaken. So in this particular case, I would say that's fine. Uh, if we were using the numbers for some subsequent processing or for something else, uh, and, and those are functions of some sort that I need to call for the numbers, then maybe you don't want to be doing the processing. Maybe you don't want this line. You just want to tell the user that this token or this and this tokens are wrong and ask them to retype it to kind of enter the data again. Um, because we're reading the whole thing until the end of the file, there is no interactivity. So the user will not be able to fix it. Uh, the question is, does this make sense with the errors or does this doesn't make sense with the errors? So in this particular case, I, I would say, yes, it's fine. Uh, we're just skipping the wrong data and getting some result out. But maybe if you are doing some, let's say you're doing some data science project and you have some data, and then you cal calculating a an average, and then you have some, some errors, like some numbers are floats, um, and then your program skips all those floats. Maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you want to round them, right? So then the, the internal dealing with the error like this would actually produce you a wrong result, and you don't want that. You want to blow up. You want to quit the program saying, no, 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 I cannot deal with those floats. Um, because maybe in your spreadsheet, before you dump the data, you want to convert them to ints. Uh, from, from floating point. Or maybe you want to change your program to do the rounding. So for example, if I, if I do one, uh, two and one dot one, what I want is I want the program not to give me three, but the program to give me four because I will round the, the last string, the last word into an integer from, from a float. So I wouldn't use ASCII to integer, I would use ASCII to float uh, and then we'll kind of round it. Maybe we could, change the program to use float parsing because this is a legitimate float and this is a legitimate float. So then our program will be more robust. It would deal with the floats. Uh, so all those questions are kind of important. And when you are doing assignments, you have to address uh, the, the questions like, okay, what is the reasonable way of approaching it? Do I guarantee that it will always be ints or do I need to deal with possibility of some numbers to be floats? And then how do I deal with them? Should I round them? Should I round them down? Or should I cut off the, the floating point part? Uh, and so on. Um, so there is a question, uh, what would occur more in the real world? I, uh, you have to remind me the context. So what, what is the context of the question? And I don't see anybody writing code 
it, it, I will remind you what the problem is. So the problem is uh, just find the pairs which are divisible by the first number. In, in our case, the problem is much simpler because you already know what the divi divisor is. Uh, all you need to do is to find the pairs which are divis dividable by D. You don't need to deal with IO, you don't need to deal with anything else because you are guaranteed that you have the number of ints, the slice of ints, and you have the divider. Oh yeah, about functional or uh, or imperative. Um, Golang is a little bit of a mixture. Uh, majority, I would say 90% of the Golang code is imperative. So you will just structure your code like imperatively. Um, but there are some patterns, especially in the in the functional uh, in the web frameworks, where you need to deal with the handlers and with some of the uh, state which you store persistently in the database. And we do use those uh, functional uh, conversions. We, we use those functional features. So in, in Golang itself, I would say 90% is just pure imperative code with loops. Uh, that's what this effectively is here. The task is just to write two loops. Um, and that's what you will find most of the time. You will deal with maps, you will deal with loops, you will deal with uh, structs and slices. Uh, the functional flavor, very little uh, in some very special cases. We have a, a larger project with a PhD student where we where, where we have quite a large code base in Golang and only two occasions where we're doing the functional composition of functions and returning functions to, to be used in processing was very nice. So the, the majority of the code base is just imperative and only in two places we have sort of something like a little bit more complicated than that this kind of functional composition. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's what I would say. Um, in, in general, most problems that you find in the industry as a developer are easier to be solved imperatively. Uh, functionally solved problems are a little bit of a niche. So for text processing, for some data processing, functional uh, processing is, is better. Um, there are some uh, use cases where they do Haskell or functional processing in, at uh, Facebook, for example, for some of the rule-based systems to check, uh, for example, if the post is offensive or not. They use a functional engine for that because it's easier to express rules and to express uh, declaratively what you want the constraints to be instead of specifying how should they be checked and doing it imperatively. So there are use cases where functional programming kind of shines, but they tend to be more niche than yeah, the broader spectrum. And, and that's one of the reasons why functional programming is not a mainstream, but it's a bit of a niche, although that niche is growing. So you will find those functional patterns being introduced to C++ and to other imperative languages such that people can take advantage of some of the use cases where it is where it is suitable. Um, so that's kind of a long answer that most is imperative, but you will find some functional solutions easier. Um, you know, if you if I look in my domain, like uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain systems, most of them are written imperatively. Uh, there is one project from, uh, not surprisingly, from Scotland, uh, and they've written the entire blockchain and they own entire cryptocurrency using um, Haskell, and they have certain properties which they can prove that the blockchain has. With the imperative code, you cannot do this proof. You can write tests and you can demonstrate that as far as you know, there are no violations of the, of the tests, but you cannot write a proof because you cannot reason about certain dependencies and, and certain way the code works. With Haskell, you can, and they have kind of proved that certain consensus mechanisms are provably operating the way they, they should. Uh, so it has some advantages, but you know, we have 
uh, maybe 2,000 uh, different blockchain uh, systems in, in the world, maybe more. And only one I know of is using Haskell. So here is your ratio, right? Most of it is just imperative. All right, so I, I don't know if anyone, um, yeah, there is a, so there is a, Perfect. Uh, so that is kind of a good pseudocode. Uh, that's what exactly what we need to do. So this um, this task is kind of simple uh, because all we need to do. So let me uh, let me check it again. So we need to we have to have a nested loops uh, which check every value with every other value. Uh, that's that's the way I've done it the first time. Um, so let yeah, let me make it smaller. Okay, so nested loops. So we have a first loop. Um, so for the index and the first value. So let's call it x and y. So for x from range from nums. So that's our first loop. And then we have the second loop, which is j. And this will give us the y value, that's the second value from nums, right? So this is um, our two nested loops. And then all we need to do is we need to check if i is smaller than j, because that's the constraint. And if i plus, no, no not i, uh, x plus y uh, modulo, I hope that's how you do modulo in, in Golang. Uh, modulo D is zero. Then we count that as part of the solution, right? So we have to have some sort of a count. Count is zero. If we found it, count plus plus. And then uh, we have our solution. So let us test this. So I will save it. I will compile it. And then what we had was five. That's the divisor. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that should give us number four as the answer. Uh, nah, that's the sum why we have the sum. Ah, yeah, I didn't build it. So build it. Yeah, we are missing some uh, count. Yes, we need to return the count. All right, so we're returning the count. We're building it. We do it divisible by five, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Our answer is, all right, the number of pairs divisible by five is four. Yay, it works. Okay, perfect. So the pseudocode worked. That's a good solution. This is the nice tidy solution. It has one problem. So I like this solution, but it has one problem. What, what is the problem? Yes, Suzanne, I will upload the code uh, into the repository after afterwards. So the problem is It won't count the, the every pair twice because we have this condition here, but it will iterate over every pair twice, right? We don't want like the loops. I mean, in this case, it's so trivial that it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, exactly. So J should start at, uh, J should start at I plus one, right? I mean, we don't want to check uh, I and I because uh, that's not a pair. The pairs are different numbers. so. In fact, this is this is a, a working solution, but it's not perfect. And unfortunately, to do a perfect solution, we have to sort of rewrite it in the more loopy way. So we have to say that um, minus one, so, you know, because to get the pair, we have to get um, actually yes, and then we have to say I plus plus and then j is starts from i plus one because you know you, you have zero and one right 
and then j has to be length of nums and then j plus plus and then because we are not having the x and y anymore we have to use nums i plus nums j so it's more verbose way of doing it but it is a, a more correct way of doing it uh, so j is smaller than this and because we know that i is smaller than j because j starts one after i we don't need this condition anymore right so this condition oh, come on this condition um we can delete so now we have an alternative way of solving it, but this one is better because it will not iterate over every pair twice, um, but only once. So if we save it, if we build it, and if we run it, and I just copy and paste the input, and we test it, and it still works. All right. We could do that. Uh, we could do the range. Uh, so Ricard is asking if we could convert this code such that we use um, ranges, but we constrain the range of the second loop to i. Uh, that would work also. And that would probably be nicer than this. So I agree, Ricard, uh, very good point. We, we could rewrite it in a more axiomatic way in Golang with uh, ranges and then use the, the second one in the, in the inner loop. Yeah, that, that would be nicer than this. I, I mean, this works. I, I just kind of not a big fan of those very explicit loops. Uh, you can make mistakes here and you know you have to get all the things correct. Whereas, whereas with ranges, it's much less possibility of you typing something wrong and making a mistake that the compiler will accept and it will be a bug. Here, you know, I can, twist the, the sign or something and the compiler will be happy and the program will be wrong, right? All right, so we didn't cover the, uh, the bigger problem. Uh, so we, we covered the first problem and then there is a, a second problem which I talked about yesterday, which is count occurrences. Uh, we haven't got to this one. So I encourage you to again, revisit it and, and do it as a homework. I will commit the current code to the uh, to the solution, and I will commit the solution to this one as well. But I encourage you not to look at the solution, just to try it yourself to do it, and then check, con you know, uh, compare it with the solution that I will post into the Git repository. Uh, try not to look it up. Uh, try to to solve it. Um, th there is there are multiple ways of solving it. Again, you, you may find kind of a nicer way than the, the one which is posted in the solution. Uh, so, all right, uh, any questions? If there are no questions, I will post this to the, post those slides to the um, wiki of the PROC 2005. So we will not have any resources about Golang in PROC 2006. We will only have slides and resources about Haskell and, and uh, Rust. And we will keep all the Golang related resources in the PROC 2005 in the cloud course. Um, and check the, uh, check the other problems which I posted on the, on the wiki and try to solve this one. Uh, it, it is not hard, but it, it is non-trivial. Non like you have to think how, how you do and how you deal with the order. So that's right. So um, Ricard is asking if you get your own groups in PROC 205, same as in the PROC 206. Yes, you will. Uh, I will hope to set it up uh, on the weekend. Uh, you can, in the meantime, you can uh, use your groups in PROC 206 for your Go projects. And then once you have the group in PROC 205, you can um, migrate your project. Uh, because you are the owner of the projects that you create, you can change the ownership. Then you in the Git, you just need to change the URLs. Uh, but like, um, if you don't want to wait until the weekend, you can do that. If you want, you can wait. And then hopefully by, uh, by the weekend, we will have the groups sorted. 
It's a larger class, it's over 70 people. So we have to actually write a script to generate it. We cannot really do it by hand. Uh, so I'm gonna do it tomorrow and hopefully by the weekend you will, you will have it. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, uh, thank you very much. I will stop.